Welcome back to Over My Dead Pod, a true crime comedy podcast brought to you by me, Kylie Caldwell. It is I, Kate Carter. And me, Holly Spear. Today, I'm going to tell you guys the story of the Jeff Davis 8, sometimes called the Jennings 8, a weirdly connecting case of the unsolved murders of eight women in the Jefferson Davis Parish of Louisiana. And y'all better buckle up for this one because it's full of weird characters shady police officers, and even a congressman, all connected through a small town of only 10,000 people. I just want to go ahead and start off and say, you guys, I know this case. Finally. I I don't know this case. I'm excited. So there's a really good book that was written about this case, and I actually read it. Yeah, it's called Murder in the Bayou. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And there is a documentary series based off of the book on Showtime. Both of those were a huge help in this. I will say this is a very exciting story, but I'm also completely shocked you decided to take this on. It's a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of moving people. It's a big story. It's a big story. But I will say the book Murder in the Bayou by Ethan Brown, really good, really well done. I have not watched the Showtime show, but I'm excited. I'm ready. I have a little secret. I have been working on this since we decided to do the podcast. I would, Yeah, this is a big case. Kill it, Kylie. Our story begins on May 20th, 2005 in a small town called Jennings in southwest Louisiana when Jerry Jackson, fisherman, found the floating body of a woman in the Grand Marie Canal. The body of the mostly nude woman was identified as Loretta Lynn Chasen Lewis, a 28-year-old mother of two who was last seen three days prior. Now, Loretta was a known prostitute in the area, and she did sex work in order to pay for or feed her crack cocaine addiction that had been consuming her life. Prior to her body being found in the canal, she was last seen by her brother at a gas station before getting into a car with a man named Frankie Richard. It's spelled like Richard, but you know, we're in Louisiana. It's pronounced Richard, apparently. Frankie's going to come up a lot. Just keep in mind, Frankie Richard. Loretta's toxicology report showed that she had a large amount of drugs and alcohol in her system at the time of death, but those exact drugs have not been released publicly. Her autopsy, however, couldn't definitively determine a cause of death due to the state of decomposition. It is believed that Loretta's body was in the canal for three to four days prior to her finding. Prior to her going missing, body being found, all that, she allegedly told a family member that a Jennings Police Department detective had asked her to spy on a drug deal for them. Not much has really been released about what police gathered like at the scene, if there's any physical evidence or anything. But police did at first treat her death as an overdose due to her lifestyle and a lack of evidence pointing in any other direction. At this time, Loretta was estranged from her husband, who she shared the children with. He had told police and reporters that she had a seizure problem due to her drug abuse and that shortly before her death, she stopped taking the seizure medication and that it was his belief that she probably had a seizure. I don't know, it just somehow ended up magically in the canal. Hmm. Red flags. So while detectives were somewhat, and I'm saying that loosely, working on Loretta's case, another body was found. Ernestine Marie Daniels Patterson, a 30-year-old mother of four, was reported missing on June 16, 2005. Her body was found on June 18th, two days later, in a canal off a highway just south of Jennings by Froggers. I had to look up what Froggers were. Do you guys know about this? No. They're people who hunt bullfrogs and eat their legs. And uh, apparently it's like a Louisiana, Texas. In Arkansas, we call that frog gigging. That's disgusting. Anyways, Ernestine's throat had been slit. And just like Loretta, she had a large quantity of drugs and alcohol in her bloodstream at her time of death. Ernestine's body was so badly decomposed that she had to be identified by bone samples, which has led some like web sleuths to believe that she was actually killed before Loretta. She was a little bit more decomposed. So we actually have an arrest for Ernestine's death. In 2007, two men, Byron Chad Jones and Lawrence Nixon, were charged with manslaughter in relation to the death of Ernestine Patterson. Lawrence's wife, Lucinda, came forward and told authorities that on the night of her death, Byron had solicited Ernestine as a prostitute while Lawrence waited outside of the motel room. Of course, I'm sure that's what Lawrence told his wife, that he waited outside. Anyways, Mm -hmm. Lucinda claimed that the two men came home that night with a large, bloody garbage bag and confessed to being responsible for Ernestine's death. However, before the trial ever began, the district attorney dismissed the case without ever publicly stating a reason why. What? We are going to see that a lot. Red flags. <laughs> Lawrence Nixon is also a name that's going to come up a little bit later. I've also actually shared with Holly and Kate a little table 
of all these people and how they're connected. And I'm also going to post it on the blog for this episode. So I definitely recommend double checking with that. So it'll get confusing. So almost two years go by since Ernestine's death when 21-year-old Kristen Gary Lopez was reported missing on March 6, 2007. Like Loretta, Kristen's body was found nude in a canal by a fisherman on March 18, 2007. And just like before, you probably know where it's going. No official cause of death was ever determined, but Kristen had high levels of alcohol and drugs in her system. So Kristen was actually intellectually disabled. But she was also, like Loretta and Ernestine, a prostitute in the area. In the two weeks prior to her death, Kristen was staying in a motel partying with a man named Frankie Richard and his niece, Hannah Connor. So Kristen was really good friends with Hannah, I guess besties. But Kristen was also having sexual relations with Hannah's father, a.k.a. Frankie's brother. Okay. They're much older. Let's just say that they're... Frankie and his brother look like they are going to be much older. Like 50s, 60s. Yeah, Kristen is 21. I'm not sure how old Hannah was at the Mm -hmm. time. So Frankie Richard was actually a pimp. At one time owned a strip club in Jennings. But Kristen considered Frankie a father and she also called him Uncle Frankie. An unidentified inmate told reporters about a story that she heard from another person named Tracy Chasen, who was the cousin of Loretta, the first victim. Apparently, Tracy told this other inmate that she was there on the night of Kristen's death, that Tracy, Kristen, Frankie, and Hannah were all getting high in the motel room together. Kristen allegedly rejected Frankie's sexual advances. Frankie got aggressive and began punching her. And this is when, according to Tracy, Hannah held Kristen's head back and drowned her in the bathtub of the motel. So from this story... Frankie and Hannah were both charged with the murder of Kristen, but just like before, the case was dropped due to what the district attorney said was inconclusive evidence and conflicting statements. All right. The government's in on it. You already get to that point? I'm already at that point. You, you've read the book. <laughs> no, but, but I'm just saying there's, you know, if you have cases dismissed that you do have evidence for, you have witnesses for similar situations all three of the bodies so far have been in canals similar toxicology stuff like that yes cool basically all have been the same so tracy you know first victim loretta's cousin who was the one that said you know frankie and hannah killed Kristen, was also charged as an accessory after the fact but little fun fact tracy was the one who reported Kristen missing and it is rumored that she knew her body was in the canal the entire time before it was found Tracy's charges were also dismissed. If you watch the documentary series on Showtime, Tracy makes several appearances. She's pretty heavily involved. So one last little tidbit about Kristen. She was once interrogated about the murder of Loretta Lewis, the first victim, but police have never revealed why she was questioned, if they had any evidence pointing to Kristen. And that's that with Kristen. On the morning of May 12, 2007, the nude and badly beaten body of 26-year-old Charlene Dubois was found on a rural road five miles outside of Jennings. So this is the first body not in a canal. The man who found the body was a man named Jamie Trahan, who was a known police informant. Probably already know what I'm going to say next. Whitney was also a prostitute. There was no cause of death determined, and she had high levels of alcohol and drugs in her system. So police started to look into Jamie a little bit, I guess. They can trust him as an informant, but not as a witness. I don't really know. But they figured out that Jamie lied about contacting them as soon as he found Whitney's body. A friend of Jamie's came forward and said that the night before, the two were at a motel party. And when they were leaving, Jamie intentionally swerved around Whitney's body on the road before he could have potentially ever seen it. His friend asked about it asking if, hey, was that a dead body? And Jamie kept adamantly denying that it was and said that it was a deer. Jamie then admitted to police that he lied about when he saw her body, but claimed that he wanted to hide his drugs before contacting them. Jamie bought his drugs from, fill in the blank, Frankie Richard. We're all coming together. We have several more people. He has also said that he believes Frankie Richard was responsible for Whitney's death because when they talked about it, Frankie said, quote, oh, I know all about that body. But I don't know if he means that in like a sexual manner. Who knows? Jamie has denied any involvement in the death of Whitney. He was never charged nor considered a suspect. He's just a shady character. Little fun fact, Whitney's baby daddy, Alvin Lewis, was with Kristen Lopez, the third victim, 
when they both witnessed the police shooting and killing of a man named Leonard Crochet. Alvin is also the brother-in-law of Loretta, the first victim. Hold up now. Okay. This is a government cover-up. I'm going for it. I'm already going for it. These people saw stuff they weren't supposed to see. You're so heavy on the government cover-up, but when you're talking about aliens, you said no, the government's not involved, so I'm just confusion. Um, Different story, Kylie. Different story. I believe in aliens, okay? That's another story. Okay, we're going to move on to the next victim. We got four more. So around 2 a.m. on May 29th, 2008, a Jennings police officer, here's your government, Kate, discovered the body of 23-year-old Laconia Brown on Racker Road, which is the road that leads to the police's firing range. Laconia's throat had been slit and her body was doused with bleach. An autopsy revealed that her body had only been on the road for a few hours. She had been reported missing two days prior by her grandmother, who said that Laconia told people that three police officers were going to kill her. And then prior to her disappearance, Laconia told her sister Gail that she was investigating a murder with a cop and the cop wanted to meet up with her and give her $500 to tell him what happened. No. No. Never take money from a cop. No. You ready for another weird little connection? Ernestine's cousin is Lawrence Nixon, the man who was originally charged with the murder of the second victim, Ernestine Patterson. So they're all semi-related. There are connections between all eight victims. Laconia herself was actually interrogated about the murder of Ernestine Patterson, and she has been rumored to have spotted the body of Loretta Lewis, the first victim, floating in the canal before Jerry Jackson discovered her. On September 11th, 2008, hunters called police for the report of a foul smell in a wooded area off Louisiana Highway 1126, and authorities found the body of a young woman who couldn't be identified until two months later as Crystal Shea Benoit Zeno. Crystal's death was ruled a homicide, but just like the others, the cause of death and other reports have never been released to the public. And before her disappearance and murder, Crystal was roommate of Kristen Lopez, the fourth victim. They need to leave this town. Get out of Jennings. If you're listening right now and you're from Jennings, leave. Get out. Slide into our DMs and then leave. Yeah, or any surrounding area of Jennings. So along with Kristen, Shay, Crystal went by Shay, by the way. Shay was also good friends with Brittany Gary, who was Kristen's cousin, a 17-year-old girl who disappeared on November 2nd, 2008, after walking to Family Dollar to purchase minutes for her phone. With no leads for 13 days, Brittany's family started their own search on foot. Her body was found bound in a grassy area off Keystone Road, just outside of Jennings. Her death was ruled a homicide, but you guessed it, no cause of death has been released. She was young. She's the youngest victim, right? 17. 17. Wow. So now we are on to the last of the eight victims, but probably one of the more complicated. 26-year-old Nicole Guillory was last seen on August 16, 2009, just a few days before her 27th birthday. According to her mother, while planning her birthday, Nicole said, quote, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be here. And when talking to her mother about the murders of the other seven women, Nicole said she knew police were killing the girls. Nicole's body was found off Interstate 10 on August 19, 2009, by workers mowing grass on the embankment. It was the medical examiner's opinion that Nicole died to asphyxia. And just like the others, Nicole was a prostitute who struggled with drug addiction. And like most of them, Nicole was a mother, and she had placed her four children with relatives shortly before her death. Nicole actually had a pretty long rap sheet. But oddly, six of her charges were dismissed before trial, and the rumor is that she provided off-the-record cooperation and information in exchange for being let go. And I think all eight of these women have at some point worked as informants for the Jennings Police Department. I was going to say, it sounds like these eight women are connected as CIs. In some way in their life, they have helped the police with other things. Sounds like the number one suspect is the police department. We should do like a ranking list. Names move up and down as it goes on. Like an active tracker. Like they do on election nights. Anyways, in 2002, Nicole was one of the many women who came forward to report that Jennings deputies and correctional officers raped and trafficked female inmates at the Jefferson Davis Parish Jail to male inmates. Three deputies were eventually charged in fire. One last little tie. The last person Nicole was spotted with was Ernestine Patterson's father. Ernestine was the second victim. Her father? Yes. Also, just to put that out there, the second victim, Ernestine, she was 30. So she's a few years older than the last victim, Nicole. But okay. All right. 
I don't know, you know, the context of them. Mm. So the police's theory was that there was a serial killer, obviously, but I'm going to explain why I don't believe so. In 2008, the FBI's behavioral analysis unit was brought in on the case to look for this suspected serial killer. But the BAU didn't believe this was the work of a serial killer because, quote, serial killings typically involve strangers with no visible relationship between the offender and the victim. And as I've been somewhat hinting, all of these women were connected in more ways than one. So I'm going to do a little recap thus far of everyone and their connections before we get into some theories and possible suspects. So bear with me. Victim number one, Loretta Lewis, was last seen with Frankie Richard, who she bought drugs from and had some sort of sexual relationship with. She is also the cousin of Tracy Chazen. Victim number two, Ernestine Patterson, was last seen with Byron Jones and Lawrence Nixon, who is the cousin of victim number five, Laconia Brown. Her father was the last person seen with Nicole Guillory, victim number eight. Victim number three, Kristen Lopez, was the cousin of victim number seven, Brittany Gary, and the roommate of victim number six, Crystal Zeno. She was with Alvin Lewis when they both witnessed the murder of Leonard Crochet, who we will get to in a little bit. And she was interrogated about the murder of victim number one, Loretta Lewis. And just like all the other women, she had bought drugs from Frankie Richard and possibly had sexual relations with Frankie Richard, according to his own mouth. Victim number four, Whitney Dubois, had a child with Alvin Lewis, the man who witnessed the murder of Leonard Crochet with Kristen Lopez. She also had bought drugs from and had sexual relations with Frankie Richard. Victim number five, Laconia Brown, was a cousin of Lawrence Nixon, the man who was once charged with the murder of victim number two, Ernestine Patterson. Laconia was interrogated about the murder of Ernestine and was rumored to have seen victim number one, Loretta Lewis, body before it was reported by the fisherman. She also had sexual relations with Frankie. Victim number six, Crystal Zeno, was roommates with Kristen Lopez and close friends with victim number seven, Brittany Gary. She also had sexual relations with or worked for Frankie Richard. Victim number seven, Brittany Gary, was a cousin of victim number three, Kristen Lopez, and was close friends with victim number six, Crystal Zeno. She occasionally did drugs with Kristen and Laconia Brown, victim number five. She also had sexual relations or worked for Frankie Richard. And the one with the least amount of connections, victim number eight, Nicole Guillory, was last seen with victim number two, Interstine Patterson's father. Who's the number one name that pops up out of six of eight victims? That would be Frankie Richard. Okay. Just wanted to throw that one out there. He's quite involved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know there's a lot of connections, but obviously I think these murders are related. But I don't think it's weird that all eight of these victims have this amount of connections. It being, one, a small town of 10,000 people. All eight of them were prostitutes. All eight of them had substance abuse issues. They would obviously, like, run in the same circle. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's too weird. As you said... The biggest individual with connections to all these women is Frankie Richard, who had some sort of relation with everyone but Ernestine. Just a reminder, Frankie is a strip club owner, a suspected pimp, and drug dealer in Jennings. He has said in that book, Murder in the Bayou, and on the documentary series, that he has had some sort of sexual relations or pimped out all of the girls but Ernestine. But he also said he wasn't their pimp. He was a pimp, but not their pimp. He would only introduce them to older men who wanted to have a good time for money. So you can just read between the lines for that one. Yeah, that's a pimp. That would be pimping. Siri, what is the definition of a pimp? Frankie (laughs) Richard. But Frankie has denied any involvement in their murders. And in the docuseries, Murder in the Bayou, he said, quote, I did not have anything to do with any of them girls' death. These girls lost their lives because they seen something, heard something, knew something that they were not supposed to know. If you watch the documentary series, he is very vocal. In 2007, Frankie was charged with but acquitted of the rape of a different woman, so not one of the Jeff Davis eight, who he allegedly threatened by saying, quote, if you tell anyone, bitch, you will end up like the others. Davis Parish Sheriff's Office has said that Frankie Richard is still a person of interest and they have not ruled him out. Frankie Richard died on March 22nd, 2020. So I know I hinted a little bit about the murder of Leonard Crochet, which was witnessed by victim Kristen Lopez and Alvin Lewis, who is Whitney's baby daddy and brother-in-law of Loretta. 
Leonard was a drug dealer in Jennings who was shot and killed by police in 2005. Leonard was unarmed. Afterwards, a grand jury was convened to determine if there was any police negligence or misconduct. And the grand jury determined that there is no no probable cause for the charge of negligent homicide against the officers involved. Several witnesses have come forward in the aftermath to say they believe police killed the eight women because of what they knew about Leonard Crochet. But here's the thing. If the grand jury said there's no probable cause and they're let off scot-free, why would they be concerned about these eight women who knew about it? It doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense. So now by far the biggest theory in the public's opinion, in Kate's opinion, is that the Jennings Police Department was involved. This whole theory really started with the book and subsequent docuseries from investigative reporter Ethan Brown. So Ethan's work is really the one that revealed that all eight of the victims at one point served as police informants, mainly in drug cases, but some in murder cases. He also discovered through talking to the victims' families, which the police failed to do, all eight victims were anxious and frightened before they disappeared. One big takeaway from Ethan Brown's investigation was that most of the women had relationships, often sexual, with members of law enforcement. Whether it be police officers being clients or through the women having a criminal history, all eight of the women were at some point incarcerated in the same local jail. So after Ethan Brown started reporting on the case and writing about it, the New York Times opened their own investigation in the case, and they found something pretty interesting. An inmate told Sergeant Jesse Ewing that the chief investigator on the Jeff Davis 8, a man named Warren Gary, had bought a truck from an inmate who was friends with Frankie Richard. A witness reported seeing Kristen Lopez in the truck on the day of her disappearance with Warren Gary. When this was reported, Warren Gary washed and resold the truck for a profit. Mm. Hmm. Suspicious. Suspicious. All that happened to Warren was he was fined $10,000 for his unethical behavior. He was cleared of any criminal charges, and he was later promoted. What what unethical behavior? Buying the truck from an inmate. Okay. I think there's more to that story, but it's okay. Yeah. He got fined $10,000, and then he was promoted, so really nothing happened. So the sergeant who found out about this and were told the New York Times, Jesse Ewing, actually hired a private investigator to hand the tapes of this conversation with the inmate to the FBI. But the FBI snitched on him to the Jennings Police Department, and he was arrested for obstruction and fired. Another fun fact, Warren Gary was murdered in 2016 by a 17-year-old grandson. What? I think it was just like, there's another police officer with rumored indiscretions. A man named David Barry. Multiple witnesses have come forward and said that David Barry was well known among local prostitutes for cruising around with his wife to pick up some women. Him and his wife would allegedly drug them and bring them home to their sex dungeon. David Barry was never questioned about the Jeff Davis 8. So I know I hinted about a congressman in the introduction, but I will not be naming him publicly because he sued reporter Ethan Brown for defamation for what I'm about to tell you. So to reiterate, this is alleged. Please do not sue me, Mr. Congressman. So this congressman's field representative owned a CD motel in Jennings called the Boudreaux Inn. Every single one of the eight victims at some point worked out of the Boudreaux Inn as sex workers. And this congressman has been rumored to have solicited at least three of the victims, but I could not figure out which of the three. So when he was in town in Jennings, he allegedly would stay at this hotel. I'm pretty sure they paid congressmen a little bit more than that, unfortunately, but he would stay there. The congressman, of course, denies this. And after news got out about this, he fired this field representative. So I'm going to give some final thoughts before I get yours. I don't think Frankie Richard is involved. I know he's like an obvious suspect given his rap sheet and connections to all these women, but He has been very much in the public eye about this case. He's talked to investigators, no issue, reporters. He's in the docuseries. The man cannot stop talking, to be honest. I know suspects have been known to, you know, insert themselves into investigations. But this Mm -hmm. guy has been calling more attention than I think the average would. I'm not sure about the police conspiracy or if it's just shitty police work. As for David Barry, the police officer and the congressman, I don't think there's really much pointing to them. One thing I did find interesting is that only two of the confirmed victims had their throats slit. 
And those were Ernestine Patterson and Laconia Brown. They were also the only two Black victims. And maybe, just maybe, these eight murders weren't all at the hands of one single person or an organized group. But maybe these eight women, who were more likely to face violence in their life, just happened to be murdered by different people with no connection to each other. So, what do you guys think? Is that the end of your story? That is all we have. So, as of today, we don't have anybody charged for any of these murders. Nope. No one's gone to trial. It has seemed that investigation has stopped. I don't know if it picked up after the series came out. But there has been no information released publicly. There's been no information about any physical evidence. It's all basically just been rumors and speculation. Okay. Personally, it's a government cover-up. That's what I think. Not a government cover-up, specifically police cover-up. The Jennings Police Department. Yeah, the Jennings Police Department cover-up. I think all of these women were at some point prostitutes in their life. They all at some point were drug users as well. And it looks like they all are connected by one person, a cousin, a father, a boyfriend, freaking Frankie, you know. So here's what I think is that they saw something or it was a police department cover up on sex operations. And so we've seen this a lot in the U.S., especially within the past century, that lots of police departments have actually been in trouble, fired, completely restarted, gotten rid of, et cetera, for sexting operations that they were controlling within their department, where police officers were pimping out women that were prostitutes, then turning them around for officers, then killing them, et cetera, et cetera. So that would kind of fit the whole process of it not being one specific murderer or a serial mm-hmm. killer. I think it could have just been like, hey, this girl is on our hit list. She knows stuff she's not supposed to, or she's going to tell about having sex with a congressman or something. You know, like I, I truly do think that these are, they're all related. And I personally think it was a police cover up. And the way that the cases have been handled is very improper. If you read the book written by Ethan, it digs deeper a little bit into the conspiracies, but it also relies heavily that the police misused a lot of information and they misused a lot of evidence as well. And so Mm. regardless of whether or not we'll ever be able to find who did this or the persons that did this is because the police messed up the cases. For sure. They definitely basically discarded the cases because all eight women were prostitutes with substance abuse issues. And you you know that the easiest victims in the United States, at least, the easiest victims to never have someone charged and convicted for are people that are prostitutes or drug addicts. My one thing kind of holding me back from the police cover up or police involvement is the fact that there were other witnesses to these crimes like Alvin Lewis, who witnessed the murder of Leonard Crochet, and I'm sure many other cases the police dealt with that these women were involved in as informants. But the only eight people that we know of that were murdered were these women. There are no males involved that we know of. Whatever happened is truly sad because, like I said, we're probably never going to get answers on these eight women. They were all killed within three years I believe, of each other, all in the same distance area. Most of them were discarded the exact same way, except for the two women that had their necks slashed. I'm still hooking. I'm staying with the police theory. Holly, what do you think? Okay, so I will say I haven't read the book. I I don't know. I just feel like they're way too connected to me to say that it's happenstance, but I do think that there's like a little bit of truth to probably every conspiracy with the police department, whether it's like them looking past things that they should be charging and investigating. The reason for that, like I obviously, I don't know, but I just think it's way too connected to be a coincidence. And I think that the police looking past all this and dismissing all the cases is not a coincidence either. So there's definitely something there, but, but I don't know what. I also don't like Frankie Richard. He prostituted women, pimped them out, gave them drugs, and he's literally connected to six out of the eight women that passed away in some type of manner. I do plan on watching the documentary on Showtime sometime this week so that I can catch up on that end because I do want to hear Frankie talk. Another thing is Frankie was also, you know, selling drugs. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the murders of these eight women. I don't really know why he would call attention to himself while also selling drugs in the town. But he was well known to these people and the police. So obviously they knew he he was selling drugs. Exactly. Maybe he had to deal with the police. 
I mean, that could also be the case of all the women had drugs in their system, you know, and it didn't come out what kind of drugs it was, but they all bought drugs from Frankie. So I feel like there's multiple different things going on here. Like, I feel like there's the women being killed by somebody, the cops either helping or looking the other way for whatever reason. Obviously, there's something going on here. Yeah, three possible suspects on the list who are now deceased. Obviously, the police department isn't going to investigate themselves. And that's kind of where we stand. If you, as a listener, have any information about the unsolved murders of the Jefferson Davis 8, you can contact the Jennings Police Department Anonymous Hotline at 337-275-8188 or the FBI's Investigative Team Hotline at 337-824-6662. And of course, if you don't trust the Jennings Police Department or the FBI, you can reach out to the New Orleans-based nonprofit called the Promise of Justice Initiative, who in 2020 requested a federal inquiry into the case at 504-529-5955. And of course, I'll list all that contact information on this episode's blog post. But no matter who was responsible for the deaths of these eight women, and despite the fact that all eight were sex workers who struggle with drug addiction, they deserve justice. Loretta, Ernestine, Kristen, Whitney, Laconia, Crystal, Brittany, and Nicole were all loving women who have families missing them without answers. There are eight families grieving without a soul to blame, and a small town grappled with the thought that whoever may be responsible is still living amongst them. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. We'll see you next week. All right, so we're going to jump right into this week's overtime. I'm going to go ahead and start us off. This is Kate Carter. So ladies, I know a few weeks ago, unfortunately, we talked about the murder of one of the Migos beloved rappers, Takeoff. So Takeoff was killed in Texas at a bowling alley slash casino. It was a private party and around 2 a.m. in the morning, he was shot and killed in the head. While my update that I have for you guys today is as of this morning, a suspect has been arrested in the killing of Takeoff one month after the fatal shooting of the Migos rappers. I'm going to just read the article for you guys. This is off of cbsnews.com. A suspect has been arrested in the killing of rapper Takeoff, Houston's police chief announced during a press conference. Patrick Xavier Clark, 33 years old, has been charged with the murder in connection to Takeoff's death. Here's something that I actually didn't know about the case is that they said during the news conference, the shooting followed a dispute over a game of dice, but Takeoff was actually not the directed target. It was the person that was standing in front of them while they were walking out towards the bowling alley. Right now, they're stating he was not the intended target. So I will keep you guys updated on that case of Takeoff's death. I have a little teaser update. So while I was researching and writing for what I was going to do next, a case called The Boy in the Box, a huge update came in. The Boy in the Box was a young boy, believed between the ages of three and seven, who was found dead, naked, and beaten in a cardboard box in Philadelphia in 1957. Authorities have announced this week, today's December 2nd, that they have identified him. They exhumed his body in 2019. They finally collected some DNA and they have located his birth certificate. And so sometime next week, second week of December, they will announce his identity. I don't know what they're holding out for. Of course, this episode will be out after the press conference, but... Of course, I will post an update of his identity and anything that comes from it on our Instagram. Uh, Over my dead pod, please follow. What about you, Holly? You got anything this week? I do. Of course, I'm going to update about the Idaho murders. But first, there is a 20-month-old Quentin Simon that has disappeared. Have you guys heard about that? No. No. Three weeks ago, his grandmother says that her daughter, Lelaney, his mother is responsible and that he is in the town's landfill. There are pictures of the FBI searching for his body. I don't know. I don't think anything's been found, but he's still missing. And the mother and her mom, they're getting a lot of criticism right now because Mm -hmm. both of them left their home and went to an island, Ivy Island, to drink and party while he was still missing. And the police have not arrested the mother yet. Is this a Casey Anthony episode? It seems like it, doesn't it? But people are standing outside their house, like kind of taunting them. And she is reacting. There are some conflicting reports that said that they haven't put out any posts, done anything that other parents would be doing if their kid was missing. A child's still missing, but no arrest mm-hmm. has been made. Okay, so, you know, you know, it's coming. The 
four college students murdered. We all know I've been doing updates on those every week. But this is the only way that Kylie and I get our updates on the Idaho murders. Yeah. Intentionally skip the TikTok. I do too. Come I do too. Because oh. I'm like, Holl- Holly's going to tell me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, it's true. Okay. So <laughs> the coroner has said that there is extensive and multiple stab wounds to all of the victims. We do know that, I don't know if it was Kaylee or Maddie's father, but one of them did a press conference saying that Kaylee and Maddie were in the same bed. So that, to me, explains a lot of how you could wake up and hear something going on. The first thing I would be doing is going out of the room and trying to, you know, if I lived with Kylie, be like, okay, I'm going to Kylie's room to fit, like to talk to her about what's going on downstairs if I was scared, you know? Mm-hmm. But they were in the same room. They were in the same bed, just best friends, just like eight and went to bed. So that's interesting. This yeah. one's just confusing because everyone's suspicious until proven otherwise. You're suspicious. Yeah. This I is like, like the new Gabby Petito. Yeah, it really is. It's very odd. Yeah, I mean, confusing. it's confusing. It really is. You can't get away with anything anymore. But I will say that it does suck that these cases like this of young girls, they get the most publicity, but it's still interesting. I still can't stop listening to it, even though I know that like other cases are not getting any attention. But and with that, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you're listening to this at. If you want even more information about the cases we talk about, be sure to check out our website, OverMyDeadPod.com. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.